Thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? Great. So um, what I want to talk about today is playful design, um, or you might say designing for play. Uh, and you might ask, what do I mean by that? And that's what I'm going to try to explain. So when we talk about design, frequently what people think of is creating, uh, controlling an experience, creating something that is entirely designed from beginning to end and that people experience exactly the way you expected them to. Um, in the early days of the World Wide Web, uh, I think one of the things that we saw a lot was that people trained as graphic designers who knew how to do identity work and print materials found the World Wide Web very frustrating because they could design a magazine ad and have it look beautiful and have it show up in every copy of the magazine and look exactly the same way. But they did not know what size your screen was or how many colors you could project or what resolution you'd be looking at or even how, how wide you had your window open. So right away, people learning to design for the web had to start appreciating that they could not control the entire experience. Um, but one thing I would like to point out is that design has never really meant entirely controlling the experience. And one of the most common forms of design, going back to the earliest times of civilization, is the design of houses, of places to live, architecture. And inherently, architecture is a sort of half-finished form of design, where you create the building, you put down the foundation, you show where the doors are and the windows and how the rooms are connected, but ultimately, people come and live in the house, and they, have an, they decorate it, and they invite people, and they raise children, and they throw parties, and, and ultimately, the experience of living in the house is as much the work of the inhabitants as it is of the designer. Um, and I would submit that web design, and in particular, social design, which is one of the areas I've been playing around with myself lately, um, is much more like architecture in that sense, where there's a lot of things you can control, but there's many things that you cannot. Um, and I think that it's important to encourage the, the user or the, the customer or the inhabitant to take, that, take up that mantle of, of co-creating the experience um, and to give them room to play in. So that's one of the senses of play that we're talking about. And what does play mean exactly? I mean, when you say the word play, at least in English, and I don't know what, what the, if the analogous word has all the same connotations as the ones I'm going to talk about today, so bear with me if, if you can. I actually did some research on the word play in English and it comes from a Germanic word like pleger or plegen, something like that. And it actually means to dance. It has to do with like the play of the body as you move around. Um, and all the concepts of play that I, I'm interested in have a little bit of that sense of room to move. You know, th th there's some variation that can be allowed where somebody can actually have space. Um, I was talking to Steven Anderson yesterday, and he mentioned a, a book on play that I'm going to have to read now. Um, and which the author describes taking his dog out for a walk. And when he lets the dog off the leash, um, the dog just runs and frolics on his own. And he says that's a form of play right there, that sort of uninhibited playing, you know, like the, like the play of children. Children in a playground, children making things up. They don't necessarily need rules or games or, or boundaries or instructions. Children know how to play. Adults, not so much. You know, we work. Um, we don't play as much as we probably should. Um, we design a lot of interfaces and applications to help people work, but we don't do as good a job of enabling people to play. So what I'm going to do is just sort of bring out a couple of different concepts uh, associated with play, starting again with this idea of simple play um, and some of the ways that that, that that works in the real world. And I'm, to some extent, going to leave it to you to apply it to your own work. This is not really a how-to session. This is a conceptual session. Um, so one of the concepts that you see in play is the idea of masks, of taking on an identity, of role-playing, um, of, of sort of putting on a mask and saying, now you don't know who I am, and now I feel uninhibited, and I can be or do whatever I want. Uh, children, again, do that naturally. Adults actually have to go to masquerade balls to feel that way. Um, but in reality, we do that all the time. We stand behind our computer screens, and we communicate with people who are not physically present to us, and the internet is a kind of a mask in that way. Um, and the identity that we project through our Twitter stream or our blog or whatever is a sort of a mask. It's an assumed identity that we use then to interact with other people. Another form of play is make-believe. Um, people get to invent themselves online. They don't necessarily tell you the truth about who they are. Um, they, they, they get to start all over again. They get to, to make things up. And I think that giving people an opportunity to do that, uh, maybe not in, say, a law enforcement context, but in other contexts, is a good idea. Um, another form of play that you see is uh, allowing people to sort of retell stories that they've heard before, or actually act them out, um, reimagine them, to, to take them over again and, and, and act them out in a new way. Uh, there's this strange uh, pastime or fad in the United States of reenacting the Civil War. And there are people who dress up in accurate costumes and they stand out in fields and they pretend to shoot each other and then they lie down as if they were shot. 
Um, and there's a guy who's an entomologist. I just heard about him on the radio a couple weeks ago. And he's an expert on the insects that plagued the soldiers in the Civil War. And he's a reenactor. And he actually brings out the lice and the weevils. And he puts them on his clothes. And he gets them onto other people so that they can realistically reenact what the experience of the Civil War was like. That's not my bag, but it's somebody's. And um, you know, this is not limited just to the United States. I also read a couple years ago about people arrested in Kazakhstan for acting out uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, which was considered to be a subversive activity for some reason. So people like to dress up and play. Um, uh, so that's, that's it for basic play. Uh, and there, there's more probably to be said about that, but I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now. Um, and I want to shift to sort of more like structured play for a moment and the idea of games. Um, and I'm not, this is not a gamification talk. I'm not going to tell you what kind of badges to put on your website or what kind of a point system to have. But I do want to talk about games a little bit and how they work and what kind of lessons you can draw from games um, when you're trying to create structures in which people can play. Okay, so one of the things is that games generally have to start off with an invitation. Somebody has to say, would you like to play? Would you like to come out and play? Does anybody want to play a game? Um, and when you're developing your experiences, when you're developing your applications or websites, there often has to be that initial invitation. Why should somebody bother to download it? Why should somebody sign up or log in? Why should they give you any of their personal information? So somehow, your, your experience has to ask people to come in and play along with you. Um, so invitation is a key concept uh, to consider. Another one is the idea of boundaries. Um, games involve boundaries. They're not played like on the playground. Kids can run all around and do whatever they want. But in a game, you tend to have S systems that you play within. Uh, this is the plan for uh, Yankee Stadium. Uh, the Yankees are a, a, a sports team in America. They play a game called baseball. And um, they, uh, uh, when Yankee Stadium was designed, there was a famous uh, slugger, home run hitter uh, named Babe Ruth. And he was left-handed. And if you play baseball and if you swing left-handed, you ten tend to pull the ball to the right into what's called right field. So they deliberately made the right field wall closer to help him hit more home runs. Okay? So that created a certain kind of game at that stadium. Now, when he was playing at Fenway Park, where they had a lot of right-handers, they pulled the other uh, uh, field in close, and they made the left field wall incredibly high, so it's almost impossible to hit a home run over it. So right away, when you establish the boundaries, you, you create some of, the, of what is going to happen inside the play. Now, remember, this is a sort of a collaboration between you as a designer and the people who come and use your design. So you get a lot of say in what, the, what the, the, the boundaries are. And ultimately, within those boundaries, they play those things out. Similarly, games require rules. Uh, again, you can play on a jungle gym. You can run around in the sand. And that, that counts as play. Um, but to be a game, you have to have rules. Uh, you, you have to say, this is allowed, and that's not allowed. Um, and uh, so establishing the rules of your social experience or your website helps give people a structure within which they can play and within which they can understand what is considered fair play and what is considered not fair. Um, another concept that, that relates to game is the idea of having goals. Um, a game generally involves trying to reach out to some kind of ultimate endpoint, some kind of experience. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, a game does not end until somebody finally achieves a goal. Well, an ultimate goal. I mean, you can have an individual goal where somebody literally scores a goal in the game. But if you're creating a kind of experience, if you want people to be able to play, then you have to set out these, these, um, these targets for them, these things that they have to reach for so that they are motivated to participate and, and to, to stay within the game and to persist with it and to come back again and again and again. Um, and I think, again, I think that's wh where you see some of these, a, a lot of this ga gamification stuff that's very popular right now is pretty much based around that idea of goals. Um, if somebody wants to earn a badge or get a label or get more points, that's pretty much goal motivation. And, and that, that is an important part of games, so it, it's worth acknowledging. Um, but it is just one part of it. Another thing that drives games and makes them work is the idea of competition. Um, People are, are, are motivated almost, uh, I would say, probably biologically to compete. You know, we compete for resources. Uh, we compete as a species against all the other species on the planet. I think we're winning, so hooray for us. Um, and, uh, um, but also, we compete you know, as groups. In families, you compete. I, I have several siblings. And you know, if there were uh, four children and five donuts, you wanted to eat your donut first so that you could get that fifth one. Um, and so that, that idea of competition, of trying to outdo other people, um, and reach the goal first is, is a great motivator. And if you establish a competitive environment, then that can sort of create an, you know, a context for play. Now, it's often thought that 
games always rely on competition. That, that, that competition is the hallmark of games. And it is true that most games that we play, like these board games I've been showing, Scrabble or, or, or uh, whatever, baseball, um, they do involve competition. And that is sort of the most familiar paradigm, I think. But it's been proven that that's not the only way to play games. Um, uh, a friend of mine who I used to work with at Yahoo, Matt Leacock, uh, is a world famous game designer now. And um, he created a game called Pandemic. And in Pandemic, uh, a, a global disease is spreading across the earth. And basically, either you all work together to stop the disease, and then you win the game, or everybody dies. So there is no competition. You can't win by beating everybody else. You can only win by working together with everybody else. And as I said, this is a best-selling game. Um, he hasn't retired, but I think he probably could just from this one game alone. Um, and so that alone, I think, proves the point that you can have a perfectly fun, enjoyable game that does not involve competition. Um, and I think that's important because this, this competitive idea is the one that people go to so quickly. Again, with the badges and the, and, and the goals and things like that, um, the idea of trying to outdo each other and get the top, top score on the leaderboard is, um, is considered to be you know, sort of the hallmark of, of a game. Um, and that's true, I mean, it works, and it works in certain environments, but often it works too well. The leaderboard drives people to get to the top of the leaderboard, but not necessarily to create a great experience, not necessarily to have fun, not necessarily to enjoy themselves. Um, so if you lean entirely on that one pull of competition as the only driver for playfulness or games, then I think you're missing out on a whole other aspect of human nature, which is that we aren't just a species that kills all the other species on the planet. We're a, a group of people who have learned to work together, and we have uncles and aunts and nannies and, and, and ways that we, we uh, you know, we, even when we were hunting the animal uh, in the caves, we had to sort of put toge work together as a team to flush it out of the woods and chase it down and then carve it up and eat it or whatever we used to do. So there's this whole idea about, about um, you know, thinking about what kind of an environment you want to create and where on that sort of spectrum from competitive at one extreme to uh, cooperative at the other extreme, wh where do you want to be in the middle there? Okay, so now I've talked about, um, briefly I've talked about just generic general play, the idea of playing at all, um, and then secondly this idea of games that, that, that I think is fairly familiar to us. Um, but I want to bring in a third idea about play, um, which is playing of music. Okay, and this one is a little bit harder, I think, to work with, um, but bear with me. And in fact, I have a good friend, um, Bernie DeCoven, and back in my days when I was a literary agent, he was one of my writer clients. Uh, he goes by the, the nom de web of major fun, um, and he's a game expert. He used to consult with uh, Mattel, uh, which is a game company in America, and he's also particularly interested in these kinds of non-hurtful, non-competitive games, and he's got a great blog. He, he finds and discovers interesting games all the time, um, and he's sort of an expert on injecting the idea of games uh, um, into regular life. And when I ran this discussion by him to get his input, and I brought up the idea of music, he kind of balked at that, because one of the things that he has experienced is that uh, musical instruments are hard to play. And that's certainly true. I mean, I mean that, was, that was my experience, um, that, that I, I had a burning secret desire to be a musician or to play music, but I had a fear of being terrible at it. Um, and of it being too hard to do, like trying to learn a foreign language or something like that. As an American, of course, I don't speak any foreign languages. Um, and, uh, uh, but then I discovered late in life that my burning desire to play music was outweighing my terrible fear of being bad at music, um, and I started to play a ukulele, um, which I brought. If there's some time, I'll, I'll show you a thing or two with it. Um, and, uh, and one thing I discovered was that you know, some instruments are very hard to play, but others are actually a lot easier. And when you start to play the instrument, um, it, it works with you. It shows you how it works. Uh, instruments are not invented to be impossible to play. They've been evolved and truly they've been designed over many, many generations to be possible to play, to fit the human body, to be the right scale for your hands. And I mean, if you look at this girl here, she's not afraid of her ukulele. You know, and so if a 40-year-old man can pick up a ukulele and start to play it, and if a six-year-old girl can do it, then um, I'm going to challenge Bernie and say that, that while there certainly there are musical instruments that you would not want to start with, um, there are many where you can be a beginner and you can learn. And, and what am I talking about? What does this have to do with the web at all, or, or the internet, or digital, or applications? Well, what I would say is that um, one of the forms of play that, that a person can experience in your application or in the thing that you're building is that they can learn to sort of play it like a maestro. They can become an expert user of it. They can start off as a beginner, and they can sort of learn. And if you've ever watched, say, a, a brilliant visual designer using Illustrator or Photoshop, 
it is a little bit like watching a, a brilliant piano player um, work the keyboard. You see them, they've got all these little shortcuts they've learned to do, um, they've got macros they've made, their hands are like a blur, and suddenly the, the, the picture they're working on comes to life. And you think, I'll, I'll never learn to do that. It's going to take me 1,000 years or 10,000 hours, I guess is the traditional standard now for how to learn how to do things. Um, and so what I would submit is that you can sort of create a, a learning curve and that you can turn your beginners, your novices, into sort of maestros over time if you give them the tools. Um, and if you borrow some of the ideas used from musical instrument design uh, to create a playful experience in that sense. So what are some of these ideas? Um, well, one of them is the idea of tuning. Um, and uh, tuning actually in two senses, and um, I'll, I'll put the ukulele to the side for one minute. Uh, one sense of tuning is that um, if my instrument, like say I, I put my ukulele on the airplane and it was in weird pressure situations and hot and cold and they lost my luggage and eventually I got it back. Um, and when I took it out this morning and, and, and started to play it, it was completely out of tune, right? Um, but that's designed to do that. The, there's, there's tuning pegs and when your instrument is out of tune, you can tune it back up again. You can play with it until it's exactly right. You tune it too far, the note gets too sharp. You tune it too soft, the, the note gets too flat. But eventually you get in the middle, or if you use the iPhone device I have, you can, you can let a computer figure out whether the thing is in tune or not. Um, and I would say that some of the best applications, especially the best social applications, have that quality of tuning to them. So one thing you might, if, if you're a user of, if you use Twitter, raise your hand. Okay, so I won't explain what Twitter is. Um, if, uh, uh, now, if you've met somebody who thinks Twitter is stupid, raise your hand. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and usually what happens is the person who thinks Twitter is stupid doesn't really understand how Twitter works, um, and it's not their fault. Because uh, if, you, if you just sign up for Twitter, there's kind of nothing to do there. And if you look at the public Twitter stream, it's a bunch of random strangers from all over the planet saying random bullshit that you don't care about. You know, so, and you think, why are people spending all day reading this Twitter? It's so stupid, you know, and you don't really understand that the way it works is that you curate your own experience. You think somebody is interesting, you say that guy Nick Fink said something really interesting yesterday, and you start to follow him, and then after a while you go, oh, he's not so great, and then you unfollow him. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and over time, anybody who says, I hate Twitter, are, they're following the wrong people. I mean, or they're following too many people, or they're just, they're using it wrong. And again, it's not necessarily their fault, it might be the instrument's fault. The instrument may not be teaching you how to use it as well as my ukulele talked to me and told me what to do. But the point is that if, if you give, if your, if your instrument, if your website, if your application has that ability in which the user can say, I want more of this, I want less of that, and kind of you know, uh, get it to be not too sharp and not too flat and just right, then that's a quality where you don't have to create the perfect universal experience for everybody. Instead, you can give them a tunable experience that they can put together. Um, now there's a second sense of tuning, it's, based, it's really the same idea, but it's a second aspect of tuning, which is to say that certain instruments are said to be in a certain tuning. You know, like you can have an E-flat harmonica, and it plays in that particular scale. Um, or you can say to your, the people you're going to play with, say in an ensemble, you can say, we're all going to, uh, we're going to play in the key of G, or something like that. And the main chords we're going to use are G, C, and D. Those are very easy chords to play on the ukulele. And these people look like beginners, they're, they've got some sheet music out, and they're, they're, they're having fun playing together. But the way that they can play together, the way that music works in ensemble, is that there are common sort of uh, things that everybody tunes to. There are sort of expectations or standards or boundaries that everybody says, we're going we're gonna to be organized around this principle. We're going to be in the key of G, or we're going to be tuned in a certain way. And if somebody came in with, say, an in instrument from South Asia that was designed for a 23-note scale, they might have trouble playing with this group because they may actually have trouble getting in tune and, and, and hitting all the same notes and the notes that are harmonizing with the notes the other people are playing. Now again, uh, I, I guess I have probably one screenshot in this whole presentation. This is the, uh, uh, the Twitter feed for the UXLX um, hashtag. And so I would say that by agreeing to attach uh, hash sign UXLX to your tweet when you post it, in a sense, you're sort of agreeing that we're playing in the key of UXLX. And by you doing that and everybody else doing that, you create this kind of combined experience that is an ensemble experience. So it's not just, oh, I went and I heard Nick talk and he was awesome, he truly was awesome. Um, it, but that, in fact, other people get to say, no, he wasn't so great, and then th that's all in the same thread together. Um, so that's just sort of one example of where this idea of tuning sort of fits in um, with the idea of uh, the web or design or experience. Um, so I've kind of covered 
three areas, the play, like a just random play, the, the, the play of a child pretending to be something, making it up as you go along, um, the play of games, which is a lot more structured and often has, has goals and, and, and uh, winning conditions and things like that. Um, and then finally, this idea of playing music, of, of making your, your experience something that people can become better at, that they can use tuning for, that they, they can uh, start off as a beginner and work their way up to become a maestro. And, 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 and all three of those areas, I think, are available to you as sort of metaphorical spaces that you can think, how does this apply to the work that I'm doing? How can I help create an experience? Um, now, I want to generalize a little bit across all of those um, and, and just sort of make my, my last couple of points. Um, the first is that there is this idea of frameworks. Um, and if you, uh, if you were in Robert uh, Hookman's uh, uh, workshop on the first day, um, he, I believe, speaks a lot about frameworks. And frameworks in design basically have, have to do a lot with this idea of, um, well, I may use it in a slightly different sense from him, but I think ultimately it's the same sense, that, that um, when we are designing for people to have a playful experience or for designing for people to have a social experience, um, as I said in the example of architecture, we cannot design every single aspect of it. We cannot control it. If we did, it wouldn't work. It would be a dry, dead experience rather than a living one. Um, so how do you des do design work in which you do want to have control, you do want to establish boundaries, um, you do want to establish rules, and yet you also want to give people space in which they can invent and co-create with you, and they can ultimately be the owner of the experience that they have. Um, and so I'd say that the model of a framework is a good one, because in a framework, you sort of lay out that structure, um, and you, you establish rules, but you give people components and elements that they can then mix and match and put together. Um, so if you think about somebody's uh, uh, page on, on Facebook or their page on MySpace or whatever, um, on, on the one hand, they all look exactly the same, but on the other hand, they all look different. And that's partly because what application have they installed on their page, uh, what, what have their friends posted on their wall. You've got a mix there of things that are um, defined and controlled and, 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 and uh, given to you from the framework, and then many, many choices that the end user can make, or even sometimes an intermediary can make. Sometimes you can have a person who lives within your structure and creates substructures, and then people have experiences inside that as well. So um, often, I think this is, this is part of the, the, the challenge of working in the web where we don't have as much control, that you need to give that up and, and say, I'm not going to sort of sweep from left to right and top to bottom and put every pixel in place and give everybody exactly the same experience. Instead, I have to think in terms of designing a framework that's flexible, and fluid, and has certain rigid parts, but has other parts that can be changed, and then give the permission to the people who are going to sort of have the experience to, to co-design it with me. Um, uh, so again, one of these concepts is control. And again, I mentioned that this idea of the designer, or the, especially the, the old school print designer, um, is that sense of control, of, of trying to give a, a beautiful, sort of you know, perfectly uh, rendered, high resolution, high production value, high quality experience. And I think that this, this idea doesn't go away. I'm not saying that suddenly there's no control or um, that you never can have any say in what people are going to experience. Clearly, uh, the job of the designer is still, to, as I said, to establish these boundaries, uh, to lay down these rules. Uh, and that may be a visual language. That may be a set of components that you've built. Um, that may be a look and feel. It might be uh, a framework of activities that people are permitted to do within your context. But certainly, you know, as a designer, as a user experience person, as a, as a creator of applications and experiences, uh, a big part of this is still taking control where it, where it matters. Um, but the other side of the coin is allowing chaos to enter into the picture as well. Okay, and that's I think that's the scary part. Um, I think many people find that uh, that you know control is easier because you feel like you know how things are going to end up. Uh, you don't have to wake up in the morning and say, "What are people doing on my website?" Uh, you know, if it's just a billboard, people look at it, and th that's the end of the story. Um, but cha chaos is also where the fun is. Chaos is where the surprises happen. Chaos is where your users teach you things about what you built that you never knew. You know, and that's one of the things that, that I love the most about this model of, of allowing for play, allowing for room for variation, of creating um, a, a lot of these, the, the context that you have in social experience, which is that users, in the end, teach you so much more about what you thought you were going to do, and they, and they help you stay humble. Um, I think there's a lot of hubris sometimes in the, the mind of the designer. The designer feels like, like, like this sort of creator god, puppeteer, who's going to like 
make people have experiences. And you get a lot of blowback against that term experience design. People say, how can you design an experience? You can't design an experience, and, and that's true. Um, but again, you, you can design a framework for people to have experiences in. But as I said, when the chaos comes in, that, that's when the, the surprises happen, that's when the magic happens, um, and that's when you learn um, that something you built has, has applications that you, that you never dreamed of. Um, there's also an aspect, and I, I think this is an interesting one, of giving people this curation ability. And um, I want to be clear, because curation is kind of a buzzword these days, too. And I think it has two different meanings, uh, and I want to be clear about which one I mean. Um, curation can mean, again, that the expert has curated the experience for you. The museum curator has chosen which exhibits to put on display. And that is more sort of on the control end of the spectrum in terms of what does curation mean. And it's certainly a very important thing, and I, I wouldn't say it's not part of this conversation. It certainly is. I mean, what makes UXLX a great conference? Well, it's Bruno and, and his compadres um, curating the whole event and designing it as an experience where not only will he get great speakers and even mediocre speakers like me, but also um, there'll be a wonderful dinner and there'll be a party and there'll be an opening night event with wine tasting. And that's all part of curation, of sort of lining up an experience um, and planning it out and, and, and taking the responsibility and taking the control so that it's not just completely chaos, right? Um, but the other meaning of curation, and the one that I'm more interested in, to tell you the truth, is something like self-curation or personal curation, which is giving people the ability to sort of collect and identify and uh, sort of uh, memorialize their own experiences. So this is an illustration of a scrapbook, and scrapbooking is a, a huge fad in the US at least, I don't know if in the rest of the world, but essentially it means you went somewhere on a trip, you had some experience, you took photos, you cut them out, you, you write captions, you, you, you make collages, and you essentially you create your own book that, that, that reminds you maybe many years later what it was like that time you went to Paris and you saw the Eiffel Tower. Um, and this idea of curation, I think, is, is, is we see it a lot in, in social applications online. The whole thing of collecting, of favoriting, of adding things to your collection, of creating a group and putting objects into it. I and mean, Flickr is great at this. It, it, it allows people to curate their photo collections and that sort of thing. And I think when you, that's a big part of, of taking the control out of the hands of the inventor, the designer, t releasing the control from yourself um, and putting it into the hands of the user and saying, you ultimately are going to document this experience yourself. You're going to decorate it. You're going to express yourself through this collection of objects in this framework that I've given you. Um, so look for ways in which you can allow users to curate their own experience. Again, I would say Twitter works when a person curates their own following list. And it fails to work if they just take the suggestions or they just read the sponsored tweets or something like that. Uh -huh. So the last concept that I want to uh, throw in front of you um, is the idea of flow. Um, and flow is a term uh, that, that describes a, a mental state that people can be in. And I think, I'm going to get the science wrong, but I think it's when the alpha waves are going in your brain. You can actually um, like medically tell when a person is in a flow state. Uh, and, but flow states happen when people are playing music. Uh, flow states happen when people are playing sports. Top athletes describe flow where on some level, sure, the, the, they, they threw the ball into the hole or they kicked the ball into, into, the, into the webbing or whatever. And probably some calculator in their brain that's really good at physics and understands gravity and friction and wind and things like that did a super fast, uh, highly analytical calculation that enabled them to kick the ball or throw it or get it to the destination, almost by magic sometimes. How, how did they do that from here to over there? Um, but from the personal experience of the athlete or the musician, none of that thinking happened at all. They were just in a flow state and it just, it just worked. You know? um, and so the question is, how can you get people into that flow state? How can you enable them to enter that state where time doesn't appear to be passing, uh, where life is enjoyable rather than full of drudgery? And even though they're at work, and even though you, you build a, an enterprise application for them, and it's just a place for them to uh, track their time, as Steven Anderson used in his example the other day, or to, um, to uh, enter their, out, you know, their expense report, you know, none of that stuff sounds fun to me. That sounds like work. That doesn't sound like play. And yet, I believe that if you apply these principles, if you create a framework, if you allow people to curate the experience themselves, if you give up some control, then it is possible, even in what should be the most boring and least fun experience in the world, to get, allow people to enter into a flow state and enjoy it. Um, a very simple, not, not very powerful example, but one simple example of that is, again, this idea of collecting. You know, if, if I build an intranet, and it's just a, a boring tool for you to find documents inside your company, 
inherently, that doesn't sound fun. There's not anything really playful about that. Um, if I give you a way to save your favorite documents, well, that's one step in the right direction. It still might be boring. Um, it might simply be a little bit more convenient. But maybe I can make that collecting more fun for you. Maybe I can give you a little bag to put everything in. Maybe I can make it, make it playful in the way that the collecting I I is illustrated or, or reflected back to you as you do it. Um, maybe I can let people share collections with each other, like the, the startup bag check that my former colleague Luke Wabluski is working on these days, where people collect their favorite things and then they let other people see them and then you learn from each other. Um, you know, Christian has a ukulele kit on bag check and he has his favorite ukulele and w what electronics he likes to use with it and where he likes to get his replacement strings. And then somebody else who wants to discover that can sort of browse other people's collections. Um, you could imagine doing that with documents on an internet, I think. And even though it might just be work and you're getting paid to do it and you'd rather be at the beach, on some level it could be fun and it could be sort of a flow state. So um, at this point, I'm going to say thank you. really just to make me feel more comfortable. I've been reliably informed that the Portuguese invented the ukulele, except they call it a cavaquinho or something like that. Any questions? No? I answered everybody's question already. I think we have to wait for the microphone to come around. Hi. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I don't see you, but I hear you. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, let's see. We're talking about a cooperative game uh, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said, well, basically all the players are cooperating together, so there's no element of competition, but still you're playing uh, against the game, right? Sure. So how would that translate into a social online environment? Well, I mean, everything from, uh, I'd say essentially any kind of collaboration, you know, I mean, it, think about it at work. Um, it, does your team win by crushing the other teams at your office, you know, um, or by collaborating together, you know? And so if you, I think this is not, maybe not the most exciting example, but if you think of the model of a wiki, you know, a shared document that multiple people have the, the freedom to edit, um, that, that's a context in which people can sort of get to the win state, like say the, the correct documentation or the best uh, version of the document, not by sort of say everybody writes a document and then vote for the best one or something like that, which would be more of a competitive paradigm, but instead like let's all shape this one up together and sort of help each other make it better. Um, so I think that, that's maybe a kind of a dry and slightly obvious example, but um, it's the best one I have at the tip of my tongue. So, uh, um, great talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have, a, I have more of an observation after uh, your talk. Uh, my wife works, works uh, in this uh, European agency, which uh, should be boring because it's a European agency right. and uh, it's a big you know, thing, office with 1,000 people. And one, one day she came back home and she was really excited because she says that she has this intranet thing. And I was like, yeah, what's exciting about that? Right, right. And what was exciting about that is the name of it. The name was I Need. So mm -hmm. whenever she needed something, like so someone to copy something or something, uh, so get a badge for me or whatever, she would call up the system, I need. I need a badge. I need a car parking thing or whatever. And this made, um, and the, from what she told me, people are using it a lot because it's just so fun to use because it's called I need and then mm -hmm. they need stuff and it, it, it gets done. And um, I was just surprised how a boring intranet and a boring agency can be fun and playful. That's a great example. I'll, I'm going to steal that if I give this talk again. The, um, and, and I think actually, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, it's easy to make a game fun, you know, I mean, and, and there's a lot of these apps, things these days that seem to be kind of point, like I still don't understand the point of Foursquare, it's a game, um, and I'm not winning it, I, apparently, but, but I still don't know really why I want to play it, except that all the cool people play it, so I have to play it too, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, but I think the, the, the true interesting frontier is how do you make the HR website fun? Because they're terrible and no one wants to use them and, they, and you desperately need to like look up your benefits or 
find out what was in your paycheck or something like that. So I think that, that, that a much more worthy place to apply that kind of, and I'm, I love to hear that, that somebody is having some success with that, um, because I think that all the same motivating factors, I mean, we're, we're wired to play. We play before we work. You know, that, that's much more natural to play. And if you can design with that, then you're kind of going with the grain of human personality rather than kind of fighting it and forcing people into these factory kind of experiences. So that, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, one question here. Uh, I'm curious of your, um, po of your view on where the game begins. Because you started off explaining uh, what playfulness is, mm -hmm. the ability to move, the space to move. But the game is more constraining, right? Um, where do you think is the boundary? Um, well, I, I, I think it's um, a couple of those elements I mentioned. I think it's when you have rules because uh, op open freedom, you know, playing as a child or just making up as you go along, there's no rules. Uh, and it, that's not a bad thing. It's just you just don't have to have rules to play. Um, but when somebody on the, the schoolyard says, uh, you know, OK, everybody stand over there and see who can run to the other side the fastest. Or, you know, we're going to climb on the jungle gym and not touch the ground. Go all the way to the other side without touching the ground. Those are kinds of simple rules that I think people invent to challenge themselves. Um, and there's, a, there, I mean, there's people who've done a lot of work on, on fun and play and how those things work. And there's actually different kinds of fun. You know, there's the fun of a thing being easy. Uh, and there's also the fun of, a thing being uh, of something being challenging. So I think that games uh, introduce some of those kind of interesting frictions that, that add more texture to the experience. So you know, playing like a child and running around like a dog or whatever is, is great in a, some way. We probably should all do much more of that. But on some level, as a human adult with things on our minds, that's going to feel pointless. You know, so giving people a point, something, some, whether it's you know a, a pinnacle to reach or some sort of achievement to make um, or some sort of mastery to gain, I, I think that's what starts to turn something more into a, the structured form of a game and less into just like a, you know, you be mommy and I be daddy, you know, or something like that. We have a song, Christian. I don't know if we have a microphone here. I mean, for the. I've got one here. Oh. I never said I was very good. And 